on? Oh, um, hi. How did you hear about this tonight? Oh, last in there. Yes. 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 Yes.
in the ten non-virtues, right? Just the basic, basic, do no harm type of of morality. Yeah. Um, they should also. What else should they also have? Yeah. Like, why take them if you're not going to keep them, right? And um, and there was something about motivation too, isn't that? Motivation. Yes. This is the person thinking about not giving the vows. Yeah. Although, next, person giving the vows. Really, really important. They also must be human. <laughs> Remember, in both cases, they can be ordained or they don't have to be. Right? Um, but they should have the vows and they should definitely be keeping them. They should know their stuff. And it's also really, really good if they could also give you higher vows. Not that, as I said, just because you take 40 self vows from it does not mean I'm going to come But um, it's good if the vows are going to come to get the higher vows. And uh, did I miss anything? Mm -hmm. What else about the get vow given? Mm -hmm. You must not have generated the six perfections for both in the same vows. Yeah, they gotta be keeping it. And it's he or she could be <laughs> should be really they, keeping their vows. Yeah. No no no, that's okay. Um and remember in in green in all of that was the six perfections, right? The six modes of activity that a bodhisattva, a spiritual warrior, um, aspires to. And also, you know, as we perfect each one, each of these six, they will ultimately get you to enlightenment, right? So we're really cultivating the bodhicitta, this altruistic wish to help all living beings. Um, well, actually, and how are you going to do that? You have to get enlightenment, right? So you've got to get there first so that you can help everybody else. So you're really, the, the vows are a vehicle through which you can amass the good causes that are needed to reach that goal. Mm -hmm. It takes really, really, really good time. A lot of it. And we don't know how deep our pockets have got to come up. So, you know, even if you don't have a firm belief in past or future lives, you have to kind of suspend your disbelief. And Buddhism will say we've been here since the beginning of time. And we're only now realizing what the good promise it is, like what we should be doing. So who knows how much we've messed up in the past, or how much good we've done without being aware of it, right? Which good karma done without this is dirty good karma, and both of them are not lasting. Okay? So what we're trying to do with the vows is, um, First of all, you're in the rest of this course. So next week, we will actually be dissecting the vows. Next week, we'll be starting with the first of the week vows. Um, and how many we going to cover? But we're going to cover a few of the week vows. There's 18 week vows in total, right? So we'll be dissecting them one by one for next week. Um, it's really great because the Bodhisattva vows are one of the few vows that you really can learn ahead of time what they are before you agree to live by them. Mm -hmm. um, but just like anything else, you know, once you do take the vows mm -hmm. and make a formal commitment, it actually maximizes the virtue that comes to you. And most of the stuff you're going to realize you're doing anyways. You're doing it anyways, but right now it's dirty good karma because you're not doing it with any sort of conviction or motivation or wisdom. And once you know what it is that you're doing, then the thing that you're doing anyways is just going to magnify in the amount of virtue, in the amount of um, good that people bring to you. And what was the definition of good karma? Pleasant For you, right? That which brings a pleasure. That thing that you think, say, or do that results in a pleasant result later on for you. The problem with karma is that there's no guarantee of the time back, and that's where most of us get discouraged or um, lose our motivation to keep our belief, our world view, in cause and effect. It's, it's tricky, but anyways, we'll get more into that. So today's class, which I'm going to give you in 45 minutes, is about the actual vow ceremony, okay? So remember there were three parts. There was the preliminaries, the main event, and the conclusion. 
right? But we are the list lineage, so there is going to be this. There's going to be different parts to everything. All of that preamble, the stuff we covered last week in the first half of class three, was actually talking about the beginning of the first step, which is the preliminaries. Like you have to be prepared in your heart, right, to come and do this thing. And you have to be, you have to have taken this course, you have to have done all of that. So that's part of the preliminaries. But the actual day of the, the land ceremonies, one of the main preliminaries is you prepare the space. Just like, you know, some of the, the um, health needs today have started to prepare the space already for the new work that's going to come after today's class, right? So you come in, you, you help clean up the space, set it up nicely, and um, that's kind of step one of the first major step of the three steps, which is the preliminaries, okay? Kind of kind of confusing. Mm. Then you, now the next little bunch is actually scripted into the, the ceremony. So don't worry about knowing right now when you do the next few things I'm going to tell you. It's as basically if the space is set up, you should have showered and had some nice um, ceremonial clothes to wear and um, come prepared with your offerings, which we'll explain and you just show up. And then once you come in, it's just like the start of class, like you'll prostrate, sit down. And then everything else will be prompted. So there uh, is the prostrations, three prostrations, and an offering of a mandala, a plate of rose petals. And then there is the asking of the vows. These are all parts of the first part, which is the preliminary. Okay, and uh, again, the asking for the vows three times is prompted. It's actually scripted. Okay. In the preliminaries, in the asking of the vows, you actually assume a certain asana, a certain position, and the vow taking ceremony is very much. Um, uh, I don't know how far back this goes, but I'll show you. So you can, you can all. Um, do it. Well, they also say you should put something under your knee, but you get down on your right knee, and you're just, um, what would this be? Uh, a lunge. This would be a, right? A low lunge. <laughs> it's like, a low lunge. What, yeah, it's a low lunge in, in yoga asana, and, uh, and you clasp your hands to your heart, and you recite. If that's not possible for your knees, you can also um, sit right down. Or they call, in, in Tibet, they used to do something called the chicken. That's where they just sit like this, because a lot of Asian cultures can squat very easily, right? So those are the two, yeah, they call, they call it the chicken. Um, but those are the two sort of um, request positions that you take. The most common one is to put like a blanket on your knee or a phone on your knee and just go down on your right knee. And then, mm, Oh yeah, and that's the the mudra with the hands, so you just put them into the heart. Okay. So in the preliminaries, the vow master will explain to you again what the benefits of what the vow, what the key vows are, and what the benefits of taking the vows are. In case you've forgotten, because there will be a gap between completing this course and the vows actually being given, we will remind you. <laughs> why it's a good thing to take the vows. Mm -hmm. And um, you'll be given an explanation of which are the more serious and which are the more, most important to keep. You know, Lord Buddha is famous for having said that someone who, so those of you who were in the Diamond Cutter course last term, um, ACI 6, remember we covered the Buddha's description of the in, infinite number of um, planets like this, right? Mm -hmm. And how you could cover them all with precious jewels and all of that, and how it wouldn't be um, someone actually someone to get who is more precious than all of that. Well, he says also that someone who has taken bodhisattva vows and just, like, doesn't keep them very well, but tries to, is offering much, much more to the universe than someone who covers all of those planets with jewels. Mm -hmm. 
So covering all of the billions of planets with jewels, precious jewels, <clears throat> pales in comparison to someone who's taken their vows for the full understanding, even if they're keeping it in a crappy way. And exactly. Yeah, that's the power of the vows. So, um, okay, we're still in the preliminaries. So that whole section that I just gave you is like the first part of the preliminaries, which is the first part of the three parts of the ceremony, okay? Here's the second part. The second part of the first part is called, so we're still in the preliminaries, but the second part of that is called collecting a collection, which means that you're going to invoke all of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas in all the directions to come and bless your vow taking. And, uh, you know, you're inviting everybody who's in the room as well as the beings that we can't see. Because if any of you took the class that talked about the different realms, the only beings we can see are human and animal, but there's a whole bunch of other realms, right? So you invite them all to come. And um, that's the second part of the preliminaries. You invoke them. The third part of the preliminaries is that you ask the vow giver, the Lama, to give you the vows quickly. You have this really heartfelt, because it's built up to such a point by having taken the vow course, having understood it, you know, having prepared for the ritual, and coming to this point that you ask for it quickly. And um, that's also in the script, that there's, there's a place for it, there's a specific line that you need to say that. So don't worry about how to come up with a speech or anything, okay? And then the third thing, so this is the third part of the first part, which is the preliminaries, is that you have to um, feel great joy that you're doing this that it's, it's a big deal. So those are the three things that you want in the preliminaries. Then the Lama is going to ask you two questions. And basically what it boils down to is they're going to ask you what your motivation is and what your intention is. So they will ask you, are you going to do this to help all living beings? And do you really want this one? You know, it's a ritual, it may seem a little redundant by this point, but you still have an out here, <laughs> okay? Yeah. Like, if you're really not sure, right, then better to work on your wish a little longer than to take the vows and immediately break them, because the downside, like the good side is the virtue that you would accumulate by doing the things you're going to be doing anyways is greater, but also if you mess up, the bad karma is a lot worse. So, you know, it's, it's a little bit of a uh, exit clause, I guess, a little, you know, or just another check-in. So you really do want to make sure that your motivation is, is pure and strong by this point. So that's the end of the preliminaries, okay? The main event is really short. And this is like anything, right? You prepare and prepare and prepare. Like even, um, like the Americans just have their Thanksgiving, like their Thanksgiving dinner. You cook for days sometimes, right? Or even mm -hmm. if it's only that day, you start in the morning and then you finally eat. And you've got all this preparation and then the meal can be in the world in like half an hour, right? <laughs> Hopefully longer. But, you know, it's kind of like that where you have all this preparation and then the actual event goes like this. So the Lama says three times, will you take the Bodhisattva vows from me? And the vow taker says, yes. <laughs> and it's repeated three times. And uh, the person basically says, I accept these vows. And that's it. Mm -hmm. That's the main event. And then there is the... Um, <laughs> The third part, which is the conclusion. So the conclusion has four parts. Okay? So the first part of the conclusion is that you, um, you basically, in front of the Buddha statues and in front of your lamas, you say that, um, 
You say that you understand that you're swearing with your deep spouse. And um, the second thing you do, okay, this is this is the first of four parts, and this is actually several parts of the first part. So this is part four one a. Okay, four one a is that you um, swear that you're going to keep these vows. Four one b is that you prostrate in the ten directions, and the Lama will prompt you how to do that. Basically, it's north, south, east, west, and then it's the cardinal. It's the in between ones, like um, southeast. Yeah, exactly. And then that's only eight, right? So for up and down, you do east and west again. Because the ten directions are the ordinal and the cardinal and up and down, and that's what makes ten directions. But it's really hard to prostrate up and down <coughs> unless you've got your yoga cities in full bloom. So we say prostrate in the in the eight directions and then the first two ordinal ones again, and that covers the ten. Okay, and then um, the, the second of the four parts of the conclusion is that you, um, you will really be, it's almost like the, the cheering squad comes out for you at this point. They say that the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, all those holy beings that you invited, now that you've taken your vows, they all are just so excited and they're looping it up for you. Um, they say that the Buddha thrones shake, and sometimes there is an actual, like a like there is an actual shift in the um, energy that could happen under whatever. Like sometimes there is an actual physical manifestation, then but don't worry if there isn't, and don't worry if there is, right? <laughs> but they do say that in the um, realm of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, they um, they all start just flopping up and down and shaking and um, they're very, very, very excited to be taking vows. The Buddhas are rejoicing. That's the second part. Like you are being pumped up, but they're all excited. The second part of the second part of the fourth part is that they're all excited, okay? And the third part is that um, you have entered into a relationship directly with all of the Buddhas and Buddhas. You have become family to them. The third part of the conclusion, this is the third of the four parts of the conclusion, is that um, you celebrate. And for this, there is a, um, a mandala offering of Thanksgiving. And um, that can be left to your own imagination for what to do with that. And then the fourth part is that you are actually given advice to hold your vows and your practice close and secret. They say that, um, I mean, it's a really great thing, and it's a really exciting thing, and it's a huge deal to take the vows. But don't go running around telling people about it or you know, trying to convince everybody else that they should do it too. Yeah, they should do it too, but don't do it in a hospitalizing way, you know. It's, it waters down the power of what you've just done and the power of the vows. They say, hold them close and practice them like, shout it out to the world by example, by living the vows, by being the Bodhisattva. And then they'll want to know, you know, because they'll smell it on you, and they'll want to know what you're doing. Like, why are you always looking so much you know, they'll see it on you. They will. Um, th those who are right to receive the information, right? So you don't need to go around and blah, blah, blah about it. And the, it's actually recommended as part of the fourth part of the celebration part. Uh, you're given advice and then just to really hold the power of what it is that you've done. Mm. And then usually with the actual ceremony that we have here, we do have a big party after that. <laughs> because it's just really a celebration. So, you know, food and drinking, music and stuff like that. Um, 
And then the real work starts, right? Where you actually keep your vows six times a day and track them and all of that. But because you have taken a course and because you will be given a dissection of all of the vows, you will understand all the different permutations that you can do to follow that. And if anyone doesn't know what I'm talking about when I say keep your book, there is a beautiful example in the back uh, retail section on the shelves, a little um, paperback pink folder called The Book, and it explains um, the whole process. And in the back of that are the, um, yeah, Christine's holding up at the back of the window. And um, in the back are listed all of the Kenon virtues, the Kari Moksha vows, and the Bodhisattva vows. They're all listed in the back. So you can also have to help yourself to those. Um, you can also download it for free online. And um, let's see if this was pleasant. <laughs> <laughs> so that's actually it for the ceremony. Does anybody have any questions? Did, did I, I know I sped through that. Of the the third part or the third conclusion. Third part of the conclusion. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't even get what the second part was. Okay. So in the conclusion, right, the first part was the um, swearing you keep the vows, prostrating in ten directions, um, pumping you know, pumping yourself up, the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas are all working it up. And everybody's just um, rejoicing because you have entered into this relationship, right? Mm -hmm. With the whole means. The third part is celebrated by offering offering a bundle of thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. So it's um it's kind of it's kind of pangna in Tibetan. Say pangna. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And um, it's appreciation for what has just and um, that's the, the second step of the celebration. Sorry, no, that's the third step of the celebration. The second one was the, you know, you're being pumped up, the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas are all excited, oh, they're, you know, the earth creatures are, yeah. That's the second part. And the uh, third part is the offering of Thanksgiving mandala. Mm -hmm. And the fourth part is to not advertise you know, your vows you know, publicly. Mm -hmm. The real reason is not because it is some big, dark, deep secret. It's not. It's just that a lot of times when we start our own path and we see the results, it's really exciting, right? You kind of want to write out and tell everybody you know about it. But it's really hard to remain that same enthusiasm. Um, it can be misunderstood. And if they diss the vows or diss your practice just because they're not actually listening to what you're saying, but they're just kind of like thinking, you're a little weird for being so excited about something they don't understand it will be more harmful to them as well. So that's another reason for not um, advertising this stuff to you openly or blatantly. It's not that it's a deep dark secret, it's free online, everybody can access the information. But um, without a proper explanation, the way you guys are welcome to do is without the commentary, so it can be very easy to misunderstand or to um, Form a judgment that mm -hmm. could be more harmful for them than that. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the real reason. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Any other questions on the right settings? And did that explain enough for you? I know that you were. I was thinking this yeah. class is actually for you. No, no, no. <laughs> I, yeah, no, I do want to know more. Yeah, I do want to know more, like what took place. Like, mm -hmm. Yeah. And again, you know, I'm not giving you the script right now. It's pretty simple. It's not anything you have to study for. It's not anything that 
um, there's no surprises in it. Like everything that will happen is just what I've described. Here. But it is a, it's a, it's beautifully scripted out. It's from the original Bodhisattva Dao ceremony, the ceremonies that were being held in the and when John and I received our Bodhisattva vows from Yamana Roots, actually, originally, um, he used the script, and then our Kantra Brahma, Brahma Ryan Maharaja, gave these vows to the student, right? And it was based on that vow ceremony that we have the script for the Three Jewels vow ceremony. So it's a, the lineage goes right back to Dhamma and uh, And actually, it goes further back than that to the Master Shanti Deva and um, all of that. But uh, it's in English, which is the big deal. The, we talked about that in the first class, so that, you know, it's not unusual to have access to what you the guys, but it is unusual to get them translated into your own language, into a vernacular that you can understand and work with and deal with. Um, I think some of you heard about the Bodhisattva Vow ceremony I attended as a blessing um, with Dr. Kinsamukashin, who is this lovely Bodhisattva, who is also a filmmaker. He um, directed the film called The Pop, which actually, if you haven't seen it, I, I assign it as Dharma homework. Mm -hmm. Find it and watch it. Mm -hmm. It's brilliant. It's basically about these baby monks who want to watch the World Cup soccer game mm -hmm. and how they manage to convince the abbot to put a TV into the monastery so mm -hmm. they can all watch this. That's just like really condensing it. But so. mm -hmm. anyways, Dr. Kenton Fisher comes through that gave the most exquisite of the Sacred Vow ceremony. It was entirely into that. Very melodic, very beautiful to hear. Um, not a single word in English about the explanation. The people who were on stage putting the vows, I have no idea if they knew what they were talking And um, that's normally the way it's given. And Dr. Kitsurabashe is fluent in English. He teaches beautifully in English. You know, so there's <laughs> Nothing wrong with the way he gave it. It's exquisite and it's perfect for the students. But I really appreciate going through that vow ceremony and understanding exactly what it was that I was professionally professional in the to do. There was, there was this extra bit of um, motivation and resonance, and it wasn't just this ritual ceremonial thing. You know, it actually had substance. So mm, that's the that's the main part. That actually is class three, but what I want to do is do a review of the six perfections because this is a really, really crucial part of remember how we ran through the oh sorry, not the six perfections, the ten non virtues. Because we talked not only in terms of the party line what they are, but um, specifics, right? Like this is really, really good to, this was what Clara was talking about. You have to have your foundational morality in place, right? So there are 10 non-virtues, and basically these are the things that you shouldn't do. Not the things you should do. These are the non-virtues, right? So, and in the book I think it's described in a positive sense, but let's go old school in terms of what the actual non-virtues are. So the free of the body. Who can tell me what the first one is? Mm -hmm. Killing. Mm -hmm. Killing. So this is, the non-virtue is killing. So what you're not, so the thing that you're supposed to do is not kill, right? And they say not kill any living being. So not just him, any mm -hmm. living being. Exactly. You know, actually, they they um they don't say that plants have um, a mind. So it's it's a sentient thing. Yeah, but you know they it, you can you can actually um beg to differ. That's a good one to take to the debate field because a Buddha can manifest in any form. Mm. That's Buddhist. So they used to say they don't manifest as a plant. Exactly. Or, uh, <laughs> you know, that gives you shade or it smells beautiful or whatever, right? Oh, so, so saying that no, no killing, right? Or you eat meat and somebody else does the killing and you've got 
Right. We'll get to that when we talk about the vows. Uh, there's there's a famous uh, Lama, I don't know if you guys know, but if you don't, please look him up. Lama Sukhari Krishna is famous for having given like a three hour rebuttal to someone who said, you know, Rinpoche, why do you eat meat? Like you're a monk, you're supposed to do no harm. How could you how could you eat meat? And he proceeded not to defend the fact that he ate meat, but a three hour diatribe on how many sentient beings are killed to bring you one more mm. So, you know, we're in the desire realm and in some form as human beings, um, carnivorous or not. We actually can't not do, but then the attention, intention makes it. And also, um, like to consume a the flesh of a cow that can feed 200 people or 100 people as opposed to eating one fish that can only feed you is considered a lesser, like, do you know what I mean? Or, um, and I was thinking, so I was at a restaurant and I could talk to this restaurant and you know when you get um, <clears throat> fish eggs? Like, oh. there's a lot of those little eggs on those, mm -hmm. right? I was thinking, like, the converse could be true. You know, mm -hmm. it's just... Anyways, you can drive yourself crazy with this kind of stuff, but suffice it to say that there is some karma associated with it, but it's mitigated by your intention and motivation, and um, also what you're doing as an entity. Well, because it's like a cow alive, you know, it butter, Yeah, there's all sorts of things, but it's not about rationalizing it out. Is it killing us? Is the karma of killing a bad thing for us? Does it have a negative result? Yes. But some of the results are that you will have illness, you will have, uh, you'll be subject to dangerous situations yourself, you'll be, you know, like all of that, yes, but, um, you can also mitigate all of that by protecting them as much as possible, <coughs> by looking out for the welfare of beings and other beings, and by doing this, uh, upholding this non virtue, like wherever possible, don't kill. And this actually refers to pests as well as pets, and not the tough one. That's a really tough one, especially if termites are destroying your house, for example, mm -hmm. you know, or, um, Right, yeah, that does. Cockroaches, exactly. But they are sentient beings, so it gets really, really tricky. We do tend to logic anything away that is convenient to us. Right? So it's, we have to watch out for that. So that's the first one we're killing. Second one, stealing. stealing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you don't want, you, you want to as best as possible not steal. Because the karmic consequence of stealing is that you will have scarcity in your life. If you are broke, if you don't ever have enough to make ends meet, or as soon as you get something, it's gone, that's the result of having stolen from the past. So um, that's why these things are considered negative. Not because in and of itself it's a bad thing, but because it brings a bad result to you. So they say stealing anything of value. And the Tibetans actually gave it a quantifiable number which in 1995 was worth nine cents. So I think mean, you can take that for whatever you want. But basically, the bottom line of that is whatever is not given to you. To you. Um, and you know, it's not even just money, it's resources. It's, um, I actually saw an ad, a little ad about the waste where people are like pulling papers out of a dispensary and, you know, using like, stupid amounts of oil to wrap something and leaving the lights on in every single room. It's like that. You know, like, um, you need to be more mindful of all this sort of thing. Third non-virtue. Uh, sexual misconduct. So don't do that. <laughs> and the biggest one is adultery. Um, don't sleep with anyone who's married. Or um, in a committed in a community where they're mutually committed, and it's just, it's interesting, um, like I said before, our minds can explain away, logically, any of the way we want. 
so you've got to be really careful in those ways. Anyways, this concentric circles of this is that you try to protect others' relationships as much as possible. You don't do anything to split people up. You don't say anything to one partner that you would not say if their partner was there right with them. That's always the best. Okay, so those are the three of body. And then there are four of speech. And I get the order of this mixed up, but you can tell me. Lying. Lying's an interesting one because lying is not just the outright not telling the truth, but it's also um, giving someone a wrong impression. Is mm -hmm. also mm -hmm. wrong. Sorry? Mm -hmm. It can be if you're giving a false impression, even if the words you are saying are true, but the impression that's left is something other than what you intended, that's a form of uh, Another form of Mm -hmm. device of talk. A device of talk, splitting people up. So, uh, again, it could be something said in the sweetest of tones, mm -hmm. but if what ends up happening is two people are further apart from each other as the result of your words, that's the device of talk. Third one? A use of harsh or harsh speech. Both. So, um, harsh speech, critical speech, is um, it's interesting that I'm one of the karmic results of that is that you are always surrounded by arguments or people like just really offensive sounds and um, it also um, after the next one useless or idle speech which is like gossip or speaking for the sake of speaking um, saying you're going to do something and not in having no intention of doing it. Mm -hmm. It's the famous, let's meet for lunch. And you have no intention of meeting mm -hmm. for lunch, right? But you say it just to be polite. Um, or it's a cultural nicety. Mm -hmm. It's a mm -hmm. form of lying, actually. But it's called idle speech. And interestingly enough, all of these downfalls of speech are the cause of depression. And apparently in North America, we have the highest rate of people on antidepressants. So it would be really good mm -hmm. if everybody could keep these non virtues <laughs> you know, and don't do them because it would go far to um, alleviate the depression problem in our, in our country. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then there's three of the mind. Mm -hmm. Like being unhappy when people get something they want or being happy when people get something they don't want and wrong world yeah, exactly so it's coveting when you want something ill will when you wish they didn't have it mm -hmm. and wrong view is the worst right wrong view is actually one of the root downfalls of the body cycle where you absolutely don't believe in time and things you absolutely think that things are fixed out there just the way they appear, and you don't believe that enlightenment is possible at all. Case closed. Um, but the worst one is not not understanding or not entertaining the possibility that the world is coming from you and not out of Because man, it sure feels and looks like it's coming out of But um and world is a hard one. World is a hard one to stick to because it takes a lot of courage and conviction to um, really live a world. You like anyone who's studying here, you're in the world view of causality. You're in the world view of cause and effect, of karma. <coughs> and I think most of us in this room believe that a lot of the time, but not every time. You know, not all of the time. If you ever have a thought of why me, or oh my God, why is this happening? Mm -hmm. Then you, in that moment, are not believing in the fact. <laughs> and I don't know about you, but I get those thoughts a lot. Mm -hmm. So I have a little work to do on my worldview. But it's really good to know what the worldview should be, so that we can work to try and uplift it as much as possible. So those are the ten long virtues, and those are things that you can keep 
you can track, you can track this keeping your six time book in. Because, by the way, did I tell you that the first four are the foundation of the monastic vows? And, you know, the monastic vows, um, we're not even supposed to know what those are. So, but Geshe Michael gave a beautiful dissertation of the Vinaya of the Monk's vows in the spring of the Vinaya teachings. And they're on the knowledge base website. If you get a chance to listen to them, they're called the Vinaya teachings. And he explains those first or in great detail in terms of how they relate to the mind and his wish for all of the veteran students to for not them to really look at them because not because they'll make you a better person, um no, they will, but that's not the goal. The goal is because you will get everything you ever asked for, everything you ever wanted. If you can just keep those four, the better you can keep them, the more you'll get what you really want to see. Okay, it's 8.25. I'm going to ignore some dance tunes. We're going to have a dance break, and then we're going to get the room ready for um, Ron's Maruk. So let's close the class. We'll dedicate everything up. Next week, class four will launch into the actual group class. <coughs> So, Brian, do you have the... Yep. Let's do this in English again. Okay. So, we'll start with the... Here's the great book, and then we'll finish with the dedication. Dedication. Okay. Yeah, we'll start with that. So, here's the great book. Okay. Here's the great book. The old book is now a piece of it. Covered with the blanket of flowers, the finger and almond, the four continents, the red and blue of the sun and the moon. In my mind, I make the paradise of the wind, and offer it all to you. And I wish to you, may every living being experience the pure of life, even when being that I am in the world of my own and my own. Let's say that again. Let's say it two more times for good luck. By the Thank you. 
Okay, I'll just stop recording. Yeah.